and I'm very happy to um, introduce our last speaker for today. He, his name is Noam Zlonim. He's a computer scientist specializing in natural language processing and computational argumentation. He's an IBM distinguished engineer and the principal investigator of Project Debater, which is located at the IBM Research Lab in Haifa, Israel. And he is the first author of, uh, of a publication which I think is especially a game changer for future medicine. And it's called an autonomous debating system. Noam, we're very happy to have you here and we're very excited to hear what you have to, uh, what you will tell us about autonom autonomous debate system, which we could then eventually or hopefully use in the history taking of people with diseases. Thank you. So, so thank you very much for, for the invitation and for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, as noted, my talk is really focused on artificial intelligence and more specifically on, uh, on a special use case of uh, language uh, technologies. Uh, but hopefully during the discussion, we will be able to make a more explicit connection uh, to the future of medicine, which is the overall theme. Of this uh, of this meeting. So, uh, as noted in IBM Research, uh, I, I work in IBM Research, and in IBM Research, we we have this uh, tradition of uh, grand challenges in artificial intelligence. Uh, back in the nineties, IBM introduced uh, Deep Blue that was able to defeat uh, Gary Kasparov in chess. And in 2011, IBM introduced uh, Watson that defeated the all-time winners of the TV trivia game uh, Jeopardy. And, and just a few days after this event, uh, an email was sent to all the thousands of uh, researchers of IBM across the globe, asking us what should be the next grand challenge for IBM research. And, and I was intrigued by that, so I offered my office mate at the time to brainstorm together. And this is what we did. We sat in the office in Tel Aviv and we raised many different ideas and, and nothing really caught. But at some point uh, towards the end of the hour, I suggested this notion of developing a machine that will be able to debate humans. And that this is how we will demonstrate the technology through a full live debate between this envisioned system and an expert human debater. And, and this sounded better than all the other uh, ideas that we had up to that point. So we decided to submit that. Uh, the only guidance that we got from the management was to submit the proposals in a single slide. Uh, so they will not be swamped with too many details. And we followed uh, these guidelines. We submitted one slide. This was more than 10 years now. It was in February 2011. This started a fairly long and uh, thorough review process. And eventually in February 2012, this proposal was selected as the next grand challenge for IBM research. Uh, we started to work just a few months later with a small team that uh, expanded. And uh, after nearly seven years of uh, intensive work, dedicated solely to this mission of developing a machine that will be able to debate humans. Uh, we demonstrated the system for the first time uh, in an event held in San Francisco. And it was a full live debate between this system now being called the Project Debater and one of the legendary debaters in the history of university debate competitions, Mr. Harish Natarajan. It was in front of a live audience of around 800 people, mainly journalists from all over the world. It was also broadcasted live uh, on the internet. And it was surprisingly reminiscent to the vision that we had on that single slide back in the office in Tel Aviv many years uh, uh, before. Uh, this uh, event uh, drew a lot of attention. Uh, around 2.1 billion social media impressions, a lot of uh, video views and press coverage and so on. Uh, the full live debate is available on YouTube, so uh, you can watch that. Uh, and uh, there is also a documentary produced about uh, the journey of our team in developing this uh, AI system, also available on YouTube. Uh, 
And what we will do next is really watch uh, three minutes out of this live debate in San Francisco uh, from 2019, but just, uh, and then we will talk about the underlying technology. But just before that, uh, I will elaborate a little bit about uh, the premise. So the debate starts with a motion that defines what we are debating about. In, in this case, it was whether or not uh, the government should subsidize preschool. There are many considerations around how this motion is being selected, which I'm skipping now. Uh, but I will emphasize that obviously, this topic is selected from a list of topics that were never included in the training data or the development data or the evaluation data used for the system over the years. So this is a new topic for, for the system. We, we are on site government, so we support uh, the motion. Harish is on the opposition. We have uh, four minutes of opening speeches for each side, uh, four minutes of rebuttal speeches, and two minutes of closing statements. So all in all, including poses uh, to think, so to speak, we are talking about between 20 to 25 minutes of a discussion between man and machine. Uh, let's see three minutes uh, out of that and, and then talk about uh, the underlying technology and its implications. So let's play the video now. Greetings, Harish. I have heard you hold the world record in debate competition wins against Should humans, I stop uh, but sharing? But I suspect you've never debated play the video. <laughs> Welcome to the future. <laughs> when we subsidize... Uh, it should be good. We are I will. making good use Ilian? of government money because they carry benefits for society as a whole. For yeah, decades, it's fine if you don't stop that sharing. Great, thank you. ...high-quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars, resulting in children who fare better on tests and have more successful lives than those without the same access. Secondly, a few words about poverty. While I cannot experience poverty directly and have no complaints concerning my own standards of living, <laughs> I still have the following to share. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that government subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poor areas. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here for this historic event. And it certainly was a pleasure to listen to Project Debater. There was a lot of information in that speech and lots of facts and lots of figures. The problem, though, is the reality of subsidizing preschools is one which does not deal with the underlying problems in society. If you massively increase the number of people going to preschool, they are all going to be the ones going to the high-quality preschools. In a competitive environment at the age of three or four, when you're learning that, you are, that that other child is potentially better than you, when you realize you aren't necessarily as talented as someone else, that huge psychological damage for many children may not even may mean that preschool is actively harmful. Among other things, I think Mr. Natarajan suggested that preschools should not be subsidized because this will reduce their quality. I would like to offer a different view. I disagree with my opponent. Subsidizing preschools will have no negative effect on their quality. If anything, the opposite is true. One of many reasons is that subsidizing attracts more skilled and qualified people to the field, improving the quality of preschools for all. My opponent claimed that preschools are harmful. I believe my argument suggested that the benefits outweigh the potential disadvantages. I touched upon three issues, children, students, and crime. Specifically, I noted that preschool education yeah, improves children's done. development. In addition, I suggested that attending preschool helps students succeed. And a final point to consider is that preschool can prevent future crime. We should subsidize preschools. Thanks for your attention. Es gibt ein Okay, so, so I think uh, a fair question at this point is how this uh, system actually works and, and the short answer is given in this uh, slide and, and uh, obviously we, we cannot discuss all the details but let me take you through that uh, at least at a high level. 
So uh, project debater has two major sources of uh, information. What, one of them is a massive collection of around 400 million uh, newspapers, uh, the LexisNexis academics uh, corpus. And when the debate starts, the system is using various underlying AI components in order to find uh, short pieces of text that satisfy three criteria. They should be relevant to the topic, they should be argumentative in nature, so they should argue something about the topic, not just be relevant. And finally, they should support our side of the debate. And once, after finding this, uh, or, or kind of pinpointing these short pieces of text, the system is using other AI components like cluster analysis and other techniques in order to glue them together into a compelling narrative. Uh, in addition, uh, the system has uh, uh, another uh, major source of it, which is a unique uh, knowledge graph composed of a large collection, thousands of uh, more uh, principled argumentative elements. Uh, and when the debate starts, the system is uh, uh, navigating in this knowledge graph, so to speak, in order to find the most principled arguments and use them in the right timing. So just to make it more concrete what we mean by a principled argument, so if we debate whether or not uh, to ban uh, the sale of alcohol or whether or not to ban organ trade, in both cases the opposition may argue that if you ban something, you are at the risk of the emergence of a black market which by itself has a lot of negative consequences. So the black market argument is a principled one that can be used all the exact same phrasing in, in many different debates. Uh, but of course, one may naively assume that this is just a keyword matching thing, like if we ban something, we should expect the opposition to use, to use the black market argument, but this is not the case. Uh, think of, uh, a debate about uh, banning uh, homework or banning uh, internet cookies. We're not going to see people standing at the street corners trying to sell internet cookies to other people. So uh, the system really needs to develop a more subtle understanding of the nuances of the human language in order to perform well in this task. Uh, in addition, there is of course the issue of rebuttal somehow responding to the opponent. Uh, this starts by under words articulated uh, by the human opponent, and for that we basically use the Watson speech recognition capabilities uh, out of the box. But of course we need to go beyond that and really understand the gist of the speech, the main arguments the opposition is making. And to that we use uh, an arsenal of techniques almost all of them rely on the same principle of trying to anticipate in advance what kind of arguments the opposition might use and then listen to determine whether indeed the opposition was making this argument and then respond accordingly. Um, so, so this is at a very high level how, how the system operates. Taking uh, a step back, we needed to develop uh, three high-level capabilities. The first one uh, is entitled here as data-driven speech writing and delivery. So uh, the opening speech of the system, this is a four minutes speech. This is around 700 uh, words, reminiscent to an opinion article that you would read in the newspaper. But this one is written by the system in a completely automatic manner on a topic it was never trained upon before. So this is fairly challenging. Uh, the second one is uh, rebuttal or listening comprehension. Uh, so sometimes we compare that to the uh, virtual assistance that many of us has on, on our uh, smartphones. But, but these virtual assistants, although uh, they are empowered by uh, quite effective AI capabilities, usually they need to handle a much simpler scenario and respond to a single sentence 
with a functional flavor, like uh, turn off the lights or find me an Italian restaurant nearby or something of that sort. The debater is really in a different situation where it needs to listen to the opponent. Uh, the opponent is speaking fast for several minutes, raising complex arguments, sometimes with uh, moral and ethical considerations, and still we need to understand the gist of that and respond accordingly, uh, which is, again, quite uh, challenging. And finally, there is the issue of uh, modeling human dilemma or capturing the commonalities between the many different debates that humans are having, and this is captured by the principled uh, arguments uh, and the knowledge graph that we developed that I mentioned uh, earlier. Now, of course, the problem is that in order to succeed in this task, many things need to work well simultaneously, but many things may go wrong sometimes in, in unexpected ways. So, uh, for example, if we get uh, uh, the stance wrong, uh, we may argue in favor of the opposition, which is not a recommended tactic in, in a debate. Uh, in addition, we may drift from the topic. So uh, uh, many team members vividly remember one of the first we had with the system in 2016, after four years of work and the debate about whether or not uh, physical education should be compulsory in schools. And the debater system gradually started to argue in passion about sex education instead of physical education. And, the human debate was trying to bring it back to the topic in vain, uh, which was amusing for some people to, in the audience and serving for some other people in the audience, uh, depending on, on your role in the project, I guess. Uh, in addition, uh, the system is uh, uh, only as good as its corpus. So if, for example, we have a statement in the corpus discussing uh, malaria, the system will not be able to correct that, as, as I'm sure many of the people in this audience know malaria is not a virus, it's a parasite, but the system is not capable of correcting such a factual uh, mistake. And in addition, sarcasm is very hard to detect. So if we have a sentence uh, talking about scientists, the system may still uh, uh, know that. And it could be even more than that. So for example, when we use uh, uh, the principled arguments, Sometimes we massage a bit, so they automatically, so they will sound even more relevant to the debate that we are having. So for example, the debate is about banning uh, gambling. Instead of saying people owe that, therefore we should to fix it rather than eliminate it, we, we use this thought, this, that with gambling and say, people enjoy gambling, therefore we should attempt to start and eliminate. And in this case, it works well, but in some other cases, you may end up saying something like, well, people enjoy assisted suicide, uh, therefore we should attempt to fix it rather than eliminate it, which obviously does not make uh, a lot of sense and could be quite embarrassing. Uh, it can go get even worse. So for example, in some cases, we have a component that tries to expand the topic of the debate automatically and automatically understand the alternative of the topic we are discussing. So for example, if the debate is about the two-party system in the US, we would like to automatically identify the alternative as the multi-party system and then bring additional content to the debate in the correct uh, stance. In some cases, it may work well. So for example, we can say something like, uh, let me discuss a welcome alternative to surrogacy. This is adoption. This is in the case of a debate about the pros and cons of, uh, of surrogacy. Uh, but in some other cases, you may say something like, uh, let me discuss a welcome alternative to global warming. This is global cooling. And we, we understand why the system is making this mistake, but obviously uh, it is not something you would like to say uh, during a debate, and it can get even worse when we are saying something like, let me discuss an alternative to suicide, which has some advantages. This is homicide. Again, not a recommended sentence uh, during uh, a public uh, debate. But in spite of these challenges, we were able to make a, a nice progress. 
So as I mentioned, the first debates that we had with the system were in 2016, after four years of work. And at that time, the system was basically at the level of a toddler, it does not make a lot of sense, often arguing in favor of the opposition, drifting from the topic, and so on and so forth. But in 2019, I think there was an overall agreement that we reached the level of a, of a strong university debater. So from kindergarten to university in three years, which was interesting to, to observe. As mentioned at the introduction, recently uh, we... So over the years, we published many papers, but recently uh, we published uh, the first paper that really described a, a project debater in its entirety. Uh, this was featured on the cover of the Nature mag magazine, and uh, it was the first description of the system. Uh, we also released many of project debater capabilities for free of charge for academic research. So you, you, we, you can contact us and we will provide you with access. Uh, these capabilities, I should emphasize, work uh, uh, almost solely in English at, at this stage. Uh, it also uh, includes a systematic evaluation of uh, uh, project debater performance beyond uh, a specific uh, or several public demonstrations. And also we try to position project debater in the context of earlier uh, grand challenges in the history of artificial intelligence. So uh, let me spend a couple of minutes about how one can evaluate a, a, an autonomous debating system. So there is the public debate approach where the audience votes before and after the debate and then the side who was able to pull more votes to their side is declared the winner. But this approach has a lot of limitations. The, the pre-debate vote could be unbalanced and then this increases the burden on, on the leading side before the debate starts. Voting is subjective, affected by many factors that are very difficult to quantify and control. Just producing a live debate with an impartial large audience is complicated and, and producing many such debates is even more so. But still, we need some kind of a reliable uh, estimation of, uh, of such a system. And, and also to compare the performance of such a system to alternative systems. But this raises another problem because there were, and uh, back then and also today, there are still no alternative AI systems that can participate in a live debate. And in order to handle that, we decided to uh, start by framing the evaluation to a more uh, limited task of the opening speech in a debate. Obviously, this is a prerequisite uh, to participate in a debate is the capability to deliver a strong opening speech. And in this case, there are alternatives. Uh, there are summarization techniques. Uh, there is the GPT-2 uh, or GPT-3 system that perhaps some people in the audience heard about. We wanted to compare to GPT-3, but we didn't get access. So we compared to GPT-2, uh, fine-tuned over thousands of uh, human debate speeches and thousands of high quality uh, human written uh, arguments and also to other techniques and also to expert human debaters to get uh, a, an upper bound. And the way it works is that we, we had this alternative systems and we had project debater and we had the expert human debaters and we considered a total of 80 debate topics and for each of these 80 debate topics we produced around 10 different uh, debate speeches coming from the different sources, debater, uh, GPT-2, human debaters, and so on. So we had a total of uh, between 700 to 800 uh, debate speeches. Each of these was read by 15 uh, independent, experienced crowd annotators, and we were asking them relatively simple questions like, to what extent you disagree or agree with a statement like, this speech is a good opening speech, for supporting uh, the topic. And when we look at the average results, you see the results for project debater in blue, uh, around four, which is pretty good, uh, just a little bit below expert human debaters, this, which is around 4.2. So this is on average on 80 debate topics. And um, uh, the next fully automatic system 
is what you see in pink and in purple, which is around uh, 3.4, way below what we were able to do. Uh, now, uh, in addition, there is an evaluation of, uh, of the full system, but I think I will, I will skip that uh, for the sake of time. But again, the performance of Project Debater here are also uh, quite encouraging, and you can read the paper for uh, the full details. As I mentioned, we release many of Project Debater capabilities free of charge for academic research. You see some of these capabilities here on this slide. And again, you are welcome to contact us to, to gain uh, access. I think it's interesting to note why one should pursue a grand challenge to begin with, because obviously this is a lot of work. So first of all, it helps us to, to push the boundaries of, uh, of AI. Uh, we published close to 60 papers uh, over the years in all the top NLP conferences and associated workshops, uh, released many data sets that are available through our webpage and uh, participated in organizing workshops and, and tutorials. It also helps to pioneer research in new directions. Uh, even the simple problem of, you know, I give you a controversial topic and I would like a system to be able to find supporting and contesting evidence in a massive corpus, although it sounds very uh, natural, we were actually the first to uh, propose this problem, formulate it in this way, and suggest a, a working solution. And of course, there are many use cases that are of interest to IBM customers that we recently started to, to investigate. And, and finally, uh, I think, it's also interesting to discuss the, the, the position of debater in the context of uh, uh, grand, earlier grand challenges in artificial intelligence. So, so grand challenges in AI are really there from, from day one. Uh, back in, in the 50s, uh, Arthur Samuel, a researcher in IBM, started to develop uh, a, a system that can play checkers. Uh, it took him two decades, but eventually it was performing very well, and back then it was really a sensation. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, Jerry Tesauro, still in IBM Research uh, one, today, one of the founders of uh, reinforcement learning, uh, developed the first system that was able to play by Gammon uh, at, a, at a very high level, using uh, concepts and ideas that are not very different from what people are doing today with uh, neural models. Uh, in the 90s, there was chess, chess and uh, more recently, AlphaGo by, by DeepMind. But I think, and in the paper we say that, that all these board games, although extremely instrumental uh, to the progress of, of AI, still lie in what we refer to as the comfort zone of artificial intelligence. And there are several reasons to that. Uh, uh, which we mentioned in the paper, here I will mention just one of them. So when a board game is done, we know who won the game. This has important implications because this means that we can hold millions of versions of, of the software, play against each other, and since after each game is done, we know who won the game, we can use this signal to further improve the system. Okay. When a debate is done, uh, we do not necessarily know who won the debate. Uh, it is not always clear even how to, how to evaluate that. So we do not have this, uh, this pass and we need to think of uh, other paradigms. And, and in general, I think it is fair to say the debater definitely do, is not in the comfort zone of artificial intelligence, rather it is in a different territory where humans are still better, humans still prevail, uh, and we think that this is interesting because it means that we still have uh, a lot of open questions uh, to consider. And I will end by just thanking the remarkable team of researchers uh, in IBM Research, and we'll be happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Noam, for this um, outstanding presentation. It's really amazing what you're doing. And to the audience, um, you should really read the publication published in Nature. It's it's mind-changing, actually. And especially for medicine, I can think of so many clinical uh, use cases. And that's why I'd be very happy to, to um, 
if I if, if I can contact you on some ideas. So um, the que there's no question in the audience, but um, I have, or I would like to hear thoughts on um, on COVID-19 vaccination, because maybe you have heard that Germany is having a huge problem and we're running into another lockdown, basically. And um, could we have an autonomous debating system to convince people why vaccinations are a good thing? It's very interesting that you ask that. We have not coordinated this question, but as you can as you can say, but but actually we work on something of, of on in 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 this context. So, but I want to make two comments. First of all, I think it's very important to be realistic about what the technology can do and cannot do. Uh, debate has a lot of structure. I think it is a very interesting use case and demonstration. And we were trying our best to convey in the paper what the system can do and cannot do. So I think taking these technologies to the area of medicine is far from trivial. I want to be crystal clear on that. Uh, it is doable, but it is a lot of effort. Uh, uh, that said, I think your question is very interesting. And we actually have a joint project with Johns Hopkins University in the US and we developed an initial version of a chatbot, a dialogue system, we supposed to encourage people to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I can share the link afterwards. You can actually try that. It's only in English at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is very interesting to know the differences between this situation and a debate because on the one hand, I know the topic in advance, which was not true for project debater. So this is very, very useful. On the other hand, I, I do not know who is going to speak to me. It's not going to be an expert human debater. And perhaps even more important than that, than that it's not a debate. Uh, the, the system should not win the argument. It should really encourage people to take a decision over which there is a very wide agreement that this is a good decision for them and for society. So this is a, a, a very exciting area of research that we and a few other teams are starting to consider how to develop dialogue systems that will be able to encourage people to take a decision. And as you can imagine, COVID-19 vaccination is one case, not the only one, actually a very difficult one because of all the emotions around it. But imagine a system that encourage people to take early tests for cancer diagnosis and, and so on and so forth. There are many, many use cases for that in healthcare. So this is an excellent connection to, to what we are doing. Mm. Thank you so much for your insights. And um, yeah, again, thank you for your wonderful talk. I really enjoyed listening to you. There are no more questions in the chat. And uh, again, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Israel time, it's quite later or one hour later and hope to talk to you soon. And we will definitely contact you on some ideas on chatbots we have in the use case of the field of dermatology. Thank you, Noam. Fantastic. Thank you very much for hosting me and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.